Okay, um, I'm going to be starting the event. Um, I would like to welcome everyone on the webinar today, Investing in Our Future, Enhancing the Mentor-Mentee Relationship, and for this very special chance to hear from Dr. Lisa Kearney. I'm Monica Roy, even though um, you'll see that I'm named Howie Steinberg um, on your screen, but I am Monica Roy, and I'm the section chair of the VA section of Division 18 and a psychologist at VA Boston Healthcare System. Before we get started with our speaker, I'd like to take a brief moment to mention that Division 18 of APA, Psychologists in Public Service, um, is hosting this call. Division 18 is made up of psychologists who serve in many capacities. We're represented by six sections of the division, including community and state hospitals, criminal justice, police and public safety, severe mental illness, Indian country, and veterans affairs. I'd like to highlight that Division 18 is the only division in APA that has a de dedicated section for psychologists who work in VAs, and the division se and section are highly active in working to build a community and network amongst VA psychologists. One of our goals is to disseminate education and information that will help provide the highest quality of care to veterans, like this um, webinar today. There are a lot of opportunities to be involved in Division 18, so if you'd like to learn more about Division 18 or join, please feel free to email myself, and my email address is in the chat box, um, or email one of our membership chairs, Lane Goble. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that we're also offering one hour of continuing education credit for psychologists for attending this presentation. Division 18 is approved by American Psychological Association to sponsor continuing education for psychologists. Division 18 maintains responsibility for this program and its content. At the end of the event, I will be um, posting in the chat box the um, website for the, our SurveyMonkey survey that will need to be completed before the one um, hour of CE can be provided. Now I'd like to do some introductions. I feel very fortunate to introduce Dr. Lisa Kearney, who is currently the lead for the Mental Health Hiring Initiative for the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention and the Associate Director of Education at the VA Center for Integrated Healthcare. She previously served nationally as part of the executive team in the VA Office of Mental Health Operations as their senior consultant for technical assistance. She serves as the chair of the VHA National Mental Health Leadership Mentoring Program and is on the faculty of the VHA Behavioral Health Leadership Training Program. Her primary professional research and clinical interests are focused in the areas of integrated care, particularly in primary care health mental, mental health integration, mental health business operations, and training and mentoring of mental health professionals. Dr. Kearney was the 20 um, the 2018 recipient of the Russell Lemley Leadership Award, the 2015 recipient of the APA Division 18 Peter J. N. Lennonbruth National Service Award, and the recipient of an APA Presidential Citation in 2016 for her work in integrated care in the VA. I, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kearney. Thank you. Okay, Monica. Lisa, I'll let you take it. From I am going to try to start my video here and see if uh, folks can see me okay. All right, I'm going to wave. Can folks see me? We can see you. Oh, yay. Okay, great. Um, and thanks for those of you who were on previously. Uh, a few weeks ago, we tried to do this and we had some technical difficulties. So thanks for being back on today. Um, Monica, thanks for asking me to come. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Division 18 and VA section is very close to my heart and um, just so glad that you all are focusing on mentoring both in here and then as well as some of the different VA initiatives we'll be talking about. So just a few objectives. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how to set up successful mentoring relationships both on the mentor and as well as the mentee and some of the different logistics, some resources that are available to you um, and how to help mentees establish and prioritize goals. We'll talk a little bit and I hope to get from you all. So I hope in the chat box you'll feel free to 
um, give some information back to us. What's been successful practices for you, both as a mentee and a mentor? Um, and what are some things maybe you've learned to avoid in those relationships? And I want to talk a little bit about formal and informal mentoring processes. Um, because both of them are of great value. I know they've been of value to me, um, myself, and I'll share some personal examples of that. And how do we always make room for mentoring, no matter how busy we are? So we'll chat through that. I do like um, Maya Angelou's um, a quote here, which is really what mentoring is in a nutshell, and this is my belief as well, is you must care deeply for the people you're mentoring. Um, and for the things that they're working towards in their own life. Um, and I like that it's, it's you don't have to know everything to mentor. And that's I think that's the same as being a leader. You, you don't have to be in a formal leadership role to be a leader. You don't have to be in a formal mentoring role to reach out behind you and help the person behind you. You know, what her bottom line is know what you know and care about the person, care about what you know and care about the person you're sharing with. Um, so that's the bottom line. If you take anything away from this message is deeply care about the people that you're working with and deeply care about what you're doing in VA uh, to give back to veterans. So a few things that I wanted to highlight. I think we often think about mentoring um, as what it may be able to do for the mentee in particular, um, but I want to highlight that mentoring and leadership development is critical for improved health care. Um, it's an essential component for sustaining the organization that we're working in. Um, for those of you who've done a lot of uh, reading and the quadruple aim, um, that is, uh, there are kind of four parts to the quadruple aim in healthcare. You know, one is that we improve, obviously, the health of the populations we're working with. Um, two is that we enhance the patient's experience as they're receiving care. So think about veteran satisfaction, patient satisfaction. Um, while we're doing these things, we are focused on cost efficiencies, um, and so looking at providing the highest quality care um, with the most attendance to the budget that we're given. But also, the, that's the triple aim. Most recently, they've added, um, Bodenheimer and Sinsky spoke about the importance of the last aim, which is focus on provider satisfaction, uh, staff work-life balance, if you will. Um, so one of the things that I want to highlight here is that we actually know that mentoring can help with improvement of the quadruple aim in our healthcare systems, not just improving our, our, ourselves or improving those we're investing in. It can actually improve these healthcare outcomes and it, it can improve all of these different things related to the quadruple aim. Um, some, some of us have been blessed to be in VA training programs, and I think VA training has started to advance and kind of focusing more on mentoring and leadership development in general. But still, I'd highlight there's really a, a dearth of focus that, on that broadly within VA psychology, within psychology as a whole. Um, I was hoping with the publication of the standards of accreditation for our training program that there would be more focus on leadership development and mentoring, business operations, clinical administration, and while there's some nod to that, there's still not a large focus on that. And so we, we find that not only do we need to mentor people in clinical roles, which I think we do a great job in overall in psychology and in our VA training programs, we need to mentor them in leadership development and program administration and things kind of moving forward. Um, and there's a lot of complexity around that, that just because you're a good clinician does not mean you're necessarily going to be a great um, administrative leader as well. So focusing on those things across the board. So I told you a little bit, I gave you a little sneak peek on this. Um, we know that successful leadership mentoring actually helps with a number of things related to our outcomes in healthcare systems. It actually decreases employee turnover. It's been connected with that. It actually helps people's productivity. If you've heard a focus on productivity lately, um, people who have uh, had good mentoring and good leadership development actually show increased productivity and actually improves um, employee satisfaction. So we know those things. Um, it enhances their competency development in a variety of areas. And recently, we just uh, I published on this with some of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Burke, Dave Carroll, Cliff Smith, Jay Cohen, and, and Kathy Henderson, who helped 
developed the National Mental Health Leadership Mentoring Program. This is a program you may have seen some emails about for new mental health chiefs or new service chiefs, like chiefs of psychology. And that was associated with improvements in strategic planning, human resource knowledge, um, systems understanding, business operations, and actually was uh, correlated with employee satisfaction of their employees, not just their own satisfaction, but those who went through the mentoring program compared to those who did not, um, they had higher correlations with employee satisfaction and burnout reduction. And I would highlight that's a virtual mentoring program. Mentoring does not have to happen in person, face to face. So some of the logistics we talked about. Um, one is that commitment to a regular time with the mentee is important for those formal mentoring relationships that you agree upon up front how frequently you're going to meet, what's the length of those um, meetings, um, the duration of the sessions, and then acknowledging that in a clinical atmosphere in which we're all working, we're going to need flexibility around those times. So a patient's going to be in crisis, somebody's going to have a warm handoff of giving flexibility around that, but still commitment to reschedule soon if that happens. Um, logistically, it also helps instead of having, it's kind of like, um, I would say, kind of the, those of you who do CBT work, right, we set an agenda at the beginning of a meeting um, with our patients, also setting an agenda at the top um, before we meet with our mentee. And I like to do that ahead of time. Um, I think that that's very helpful uh, for the mentee to kind of think through, these are the things I want to talk to the mentor about and give them a little bit of um, heads up. And right now I have a relationship mentoring, formal mentoring relationship with someone who's excellent about that. You know, sending me a few days beforehand, here's what I want to talk about. And that way if I have resources or things I can think through or can you review this document for me beforehand, it really helps. And that kind of all can be designed in a mentoring agreement. That can be formal or in writing or, or informal. Um, setting prioritized goals at the top of a mentoring relationship can be incredibly helpful. Where do those goals come from? That They obviously should come from the mentee, but in some of our formal mentoring programs, we actually have people do 360 degree evaluations. And I, and I put a um, hyperlink in here for you guys because this is particularly helpful if you're new into a leadership role. 360 degrees means that people evaluate you kind of um, who are reporting up to you, that are working beside you, and then are working over you um, all together. <clears throat> and there's servant leadership models within VA for these 360 degree evaluations. And I found them incredibly helpful as a mentee myself. I've done probably three or four of these across my career. Very good to hear kind of how do the people who report up to me, how are they feeling I'm doing in these different leadership areas, as well as my colleagues and then those above me. And some of that can be really um, surprising. Um, I know for a fact, like when I'm setting my own mentoring goals, I, ha I know what I want to work on. But to hear from my peers and hear from my boss and hear from others um, that are working for me, that um, here are some things we actually think you should work on. Um, and, and again, some of that can become a surprise. Um, like I know one of the most shocking things to me, and now I've, I've just kind of embraced this, um, is that people f find me intimidating, which I think, well, gosh, I'm, I thought I was pretty approachable and nice, you know? Um, but that that was something I needed to work on um, with other people, and that my mentor was incredibly helpful to me and helping me to see how when I went from a clinician to an administrator, you know, part of that can be mean, you know, that's a power role and that can be intimidating to people, even if I am approachable, so how do I address that? So that would be like a blind spot for me if I didn't do this. The other thing is to look at other um, self-evaluations that can be done. As part of our national uh, mentoring program, we do have a kind of skills self-assessment tool that we have all of our mentees complete. In each of those areas I discussed earlier, strategic planning, business operations, HR understanding. So they could identify, yeah, I know a lot about this, but not so much about this other area. So it helps guide the mentor and mentee when they create their learning plan together to say, these are the areas I want to work on. Um, it may be something different for you. So I'll say, like, if you're working in primary care mental health integration, there's a wonderful fidelity tool built by Greg Bueller that helps identify 
where are you doing well with a model and where are areas of growth for you as a clinician? And so I think you have to, you know, use the resources that are available for you. Um, the other good way to do this is also look at your own functional statement for your job um, or helping your mentee take a look at that to say, okay, what do you feel like you already have a great handle on and then what are some growth areas? Or to take the functional statement of the job that you're going for next and seeing where do you want I want to go. Um, others, you can do that informally, like having the mentee talk with their supervisor. Um, this was incredibly helpful for me. One of my early feedbacks from Steve Holliday, who's now the Visit Mental Health Lead in 17, gave me when I was a frontline staff member is, Lisa, you have a great knowledge base of mental health. We don't have a knowledge base of is the healthcare system as a whole, so we need to grow you in your understanding of primary care operations. HR, surgery, how do all of these work together at the hospital and how does mental health support them? And that was incredible feedback for me. Um, and then discussion with others um, and your same role at other facilities. You know, what are areas that maybe they are advanced in that you want to bring into your mentoring relationship? So again, it's not just thinking as a mentee, what do I want to do myself, but trying to get feedback from all of these different areas to help um, design goals for yourself. Uh, with your mentor. And you can see I'm in this presentation kind of jumping between all of us at any point, our mentors and mentees. And so thinking about that across the way. Um, the other thing I like to highlight is, as I've kind of gone through my, I've had wonderful mentees, uh, mentors over the years who've helped me to rethink this. I think early on I often thought about, okay, I need to grow in this area, this area, this area. Um, to have a more strengths-based acknowledgement. Where are my goals um, based on my return on investment? There's uh, tons of stuff, you know, like I could spend all day focusing on learning VERA and how funding of VA goes. I've got a cursory knowledge of that um, from being a chief before, but I'm not as good as Ellen Bradley who heads up VERA. Um, is it worth my time to spend hours each week focusing on having greater knowledge in that versus where I am now, do I want to hire staff that are that, or can I reference other staff to round me out? And I think now I think more in lines of, okay, I know this is an area of uh, weakness or limitation for me. Do I want to spend the rest of my year or two years when I'm working with my ment mentor on this area, or would it be better for me to focus on a current strength I have, like program development, and kind of build that knowledge base further? Will I get more bang from my buck there? So it's not always working with a mentee on their area of you know, weakness or opportunity for improvement, but how can you help them build on their strengths? How can you build on your strengths? That may be more worth your return on investment. One of the models um, that I think is helpful kind of logistically, and you can think through this, if you become uh, trained as a, a certified mentor in VA, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, connections to that, that's something I went through um, about 10 years ago. They have what they call the GROW model that they encourage their mentors to use with their mentees. And GROW just stands for goal, establishing the goal, um, reality, examining what's the mentee's current reality. O is the options, explore what their options are to grow in that area, and then establishing the will, that's the W. And so they encourage at the start of a mentoring uh, relationship as well as each session to talk with the mentee about what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve, what do you want to achieve today, what is it the, the next goal that you're working on, when do you want it to be achieved by and asking some questions about that and then helping the mentee to say okay what what have you done so far what's happening right now what's your current reality what are challenges you've had what are facilitators and then go into okay what's next what are options for you and then what's your will yeah uh, you know what what could stop you from moving forward um, you know, how are you going to have to address this and, and getting kind of more into the practical barriers um, and things that they can do to help be successful. So that's an organizational structure. I've, I've uh, connected you to a website on that. 
that talks a little bit more in depth, but that's great if you're new at doing formal mentoring, this may be a model for you to kind of take a look at. It helps organize those ment mentoring meetings, if you will. Um, these are some other, um, I gave you the little uh, di uh, uh, picture there for GROW, so you'll see this on some of the materials for VHA mentor certification. But there's also resources uh, to help build off of that 360 degree evaluation. Um, I encourage you to connect to this link on the personal development plan. Um, a lot of times when we're doing formal mentoring within VA mentoring programs, we ask for people to develop this PDP and it helps you to look at each of the areas that are evaluated in the 360 and align that with specific goals and objectives and it's something that you can kind of help the mentee track over time or you can track yourself over time and I found that very helpful when I was using the different um, leadership models within VA. Same thing there's an I lead 360 degree plan so I encourage you just wanted to give you resources as you're both mentoring and being um, mentored as well that might be helpful for you. So I want to pause here for a moment. I've been talking for about uh, way too long, about 15 minutes or so. I'd like to have you all type in the chat box, just brainstorm for a moment. What are things that your mentors have been done have done that are particularly helpful? Um, what are helpful practices that you might want to um, encourage um, in other mentoring relationships? So think for a moment about your maybe your best mentor you've had to date. What were some of the characteristics or behaviors that they did in the mentoring relationship to help you? And I'm going to pick on Monica because I can hear in her voice for a moment. So Monica, if you don't mind sharing for a moment something a prior mentor has done that's been positive while that allows people to chat in the chat box. Um, I would say I've had some excellent mentors throughout my career and life, including mentors that have encouraged me to go back to grad school. Um, and I think the mo you know, providing a lot of encouragement, support, and I think for me the reality of what it means to work at the VA, um, providing me with some feedback of things that I have to work on has been really helpful. Um, but I think that my mentors have I think their energy, that's always been incredibly motivating. I've had some mentors that I don't know where they get that much energy, and it keeps me going. Um, <laughs> so, um, But I think also being able to receive some feedback from them about what they think is going to be the most helpful for me in my career path, and that's just always so valuable, um, getting that type of insight from people who are um, well ahead and have gone through the process. That's wonderful, wonderful. I, I love that you talk about sharing that energy. I, I've also felt the same about some of my mentors, just hearing their passion about different areas also in, ends up energizing me when you see someone like that. <laughs> Definitely, especially with, I've had some mentors who've done a lot of work, um, and so I'm always impressed that they still have so much energy. <laughs> I see a few <laughs> people um, writing into the chat box here. That's um, great. So I see um, Mandy Owens has said, my mentor had us set a big set big goals for the year and then break it down in these big goals into monthly goals. She always regularly mm -hmm. checked in about those plans, which was helpful. I'll, I'll say for me too, I had a mentor that told me, set three major goals per year that you want to work on. Um, and so awesome. that was always a, a nice way to think about it. I love that, Mandy. I'm glad that you wrote that down because I think it's really important to be intentional. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I still I do a lot of tracking of my goals, but like here's my little calendar for July, and I have my monthly goals here, and then I've got all my you know goals broken down by category over here, you know. And I I, I think that just helps us keep on target, um, and to have someone keep you accountable and checking in. Okay, let me try to scroll down here, Monica. Uh, Let's see, Nicole, role modeling, how to balance multiple expectations, but how to also say no. Oh, Nicole, that is priceless, isn't it? Um, I had one of my mentors who was, uh, you know, your bosses can mentor you in, in ways, used to tell me, Lisa, I'm going to give you a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> and at times I need you to just say, 
I need you to say yes when I give you a next task, but to help you need to say, yes, I can do that. What can I put on the back burner now of these other things you've given me to help prioritize this? So in a way, it was kind of like how to say no, but in a, in a different fashion as well. And that was a very good life lesson for me because I used to always just say yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, Genevieve, did you read this one, Monica? Providing a different perspective, devil's advocate, and providing specific ideas and recommendations. That's really good, Genevieve. Yeah, that's great to be able to see things from different views. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes, especially when we're in a, uh, for me, when I've been, been in painful situations in my life, it's good to have someone to help provide a different perspective or help me to think, you know, how this other person I may be having a challenge with at the time, how, how might they be seeing things? Oh, Sarah, some of my best mentors cultivate an environment of trust that allows me to really explore personal and professional challenges. Yeah, that's a big one. If you don't have trust, I don't even know if you can have a mentoring relationship. Okay, Josh is seconding uh, Monica's comment about positive and supportive energy. Um, oh, I love this, Josh. So checking in not just about the uh, professional goals, but also kind of the uh, personal goals as well. Um, and how it's impacting, how are those professional things impacting our personal lives too. That's great. Okay, I want you all to kind of continue. These are great, and, and please keep typing these in. We can refer back to these because you can see if this kind of agrees with or doesn't agree with what some of the literature says. Um, think about, again, the, that person that just gave into your life, who poured into your life, um, and you know what is it that you want to mimic as a mentor, and what are you looking for in a mentor? Uh, okay, let me keep going here. Um, these are some practical things from the mentor certification manual that I, I talked a little bit about. You know, if you want to go through the VHA mentor program, if you go to that hyperlink I put in earlier. Um, one of the things that they really emphasize in there is providing edible feedback. And they, they talk about the sandwich technique, which we probably all know as psychologists. You start with something positive, then you put in, you know, here's an opportunity for growth, and then you put on the, you know, the bottom of the sandwich. It's all in together. And um, that's, for me, um, I have had mentors that are super encouraging, and um, that's wonderful. But I, I think sometimes the most beneficial feedback I get is the hard stuff. And, and saying in a way where I feel supported um, still, um, and having someone, um, I've also had good, really good bosses, Mary Shown is, is one of them, who somehow kind of getting down to that trust comment that some of you uh, commented on earlier, I never felt like I was a failure uh, coming to her when a project that I had, you know, failed or didn't accomplish what I had, had intended, or even when I screwed up, I never felt like a failure with Mary. And I think um, that was uh, part of this. She was a I was able to fully trust her. Um, there was psychological safety there, but I also knew she she get she was a straight shooter. Um, she wasn't a, a touchy feely kind of person. She was able to give me feedback on how to grow at the same time. But I think that that's really critical. The other thing is um, having the ability to give our mentees empowerment. Uh, you know, asking them critical questions. You know, what's your most powerful next step? What would you try to do if you knew if you, you wouldn't fail? What would you try to do? Um, and oftentimes, we ourselves are in situations within VA, within our own lives, where we don't feel so powerful. And I think it's really important that we, when we mentor, that we help folks really think about what do they have the power to change? How can they move back? Because we always have power. We always have power. We always have things that we can do. Even if it's just our attitude, our mindset, we always have power. And so helping the mentee come along that. Um, the other thing is deeply listening to our mentees. Um, 
and you know that's one I have a colleague Kathy Dollar who's just incredible I think she's the most incredible listener ever um, when you know Russell Limley for those of you who know Russell Russell listens when you are with Russell you have his uh, full attention and uh, trying to turn off all these other things peeing at us on the computer so that we're fully present and we know how to do this skill as psychologists we don't always practice it and then helping mentees be truly aware you know um, thinking at, uh, really critically about the environment they're in and what what's underneath the concern that we have um, I think those are all important things here's here's a few other and some of you touched on these um, you know obviously willingness to provide guidance ability to invest you know, here the, the mentor certification talks about time monthly. It may be more or less, depending on what your agreement is with the mentee. Um, someone else talked about role modeling. I think that was Nicole. You know, looking at how do you do things. Um, I, I like to also be very frank um, with people that I mentor. I think sometimes people have a tendency to look at their mentors and kind of put them up on a pedestal, which is, is not always good. They're human. They're going to fail. I like to share about where I fail to normalize that for people. Um, I think that's really important for folks is that you share when you've had mess ups, too, because I feel like we learn a lot from where others mess up, too, if you will. It's, a, it's all part of our learning. Um, and these are other things. Um, now, able to guide people, go coaching skills, these are all kind of more practical, practical things. Um, but I, I do like kind of modeling um, leadership and helping, helping, you know, too, a, a good mentors open doors for their mentees. Um, that they connect them, they promote them, not necessarily they promote them themselves, like they're hiring them, but they promote them to other opportunities, they connect them with other people, they connect them with organizations to help move forward the goals. Uh, they connect them with knowledge. Uh, those are some of the key things. Um, I want to kind of look back, kind of, what about for the mentee? You know, um, what are successful things that we can do as mentees to help move things forward? I think, you know, one we spoke about earlier, the mentee setting a clear agenda. These are the things that, that I'd like to accomplish today, or these are the things I want to work on. Establishing clear goals. So we're not in this complete you know, goalless uh, kind of meeting, but we're moving forward to what the mentee would, wishes to focus on. And that they follow up, you know, when we follow up on next steps that our, our mentors suggest, or, you know, we say, well, we tried that, that didn't work, but here was plan B. And that we ask specific questions about, uh, you know, what resources would be beneficial. Um, having had multiple mentors across my VA career, some were fantastic in business operations. Some were fantastic in uh, relationship knowledge or systems knowledge. None of my mentors, I would say, knew everything that I wanted to grow in, but often they were able to connect me with the people who had that knowledge. Um, and so being able to connect uh, for others. So now I'm going to transition, and here I hope to hear from you too. And, and Monica, I'll put you on the spot since you've got audio, but while others are thinking, what are some things that maybe you've experienced is not so helpful that uh, mentors have done or maybe as a mentee you, you you yourself have learned something of you know I did this and it really wasn't so helpful um, in a mentoring relationship um, I, thinking back on my own I think sometimes what I did is I would come to a meeting not uh, prepared with specific goals and it kind of especially with a new mentor uh, the conversation would kind of stall out. Um, we ha I, and I learned to kind of come come to the meeting with an agenda. Monica, did you have anything lessons learned or things here about unhelpful practices? Oh gosh, um, I feel like I've had such wonderful mentors. Um, I think sometimes maybe for me, even though they're not supervisors, but um, people who've been clearly more um, seasoned in their careers, kind of having some evaluation bias. So I'd say for me, learning uh, what I could have done a little bit differently is talk more about some of my vulnerabilities um, versus, and really utilize that part of the relationship. Um, so I'd yeah. say as a mentee, um, just, you know, we're often being, I think about some of, we're often being um, 
evaluated at work, at grad school. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure I kind of thought differently about the mentoring relationship versus a supervisor. Uh, uh, those are great, great points. I also see Genevieve has written something in. I, gosh, that's also something I am yeah, looking at what you're saying here, Genevieve. I struggle with that as a parent, too. <laughs> You know, uh, sometimes I just want to uh, fix the situation or move the person from the environment instead of helping them talk through and kind of struggle with it for a little bit and helping them grow through the process, even though it might be less painful to just move them into a different situation, you know, help them struggle through that so that they learn um, and can grow. Um, their skills in that. That's a great one, Genevieve. I'm glad you're mentioning that. Um, the other thing that I felt like, like I know I've done wrong in the past is um, I've had uh, mentees sometimes where it just doesn't click, um, especially like in formal mentoring programs where we're often assigned folks, and then having that relationship continue for a really long time. Um, and I think as I've grown, um, it's okay to say, hey, you know, I don't think I'm meeting your needs. I, I think you may need somebody else here for what you're looking to. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you don't care about the person. It's that you may not be a good match for where they're at right now. And, and that's one of the drawbacks of formal mentoring. Sometimes you're, you know, thrown in with someone that may not be as much of a match, even if on paper you're a match. Um, and just to acknowledge that and say that, you know, that's okay instead of having, you know, trying to continue to force it. Uh, so be, be thinking about this as, as we continue through. I think here's some other ones um, just, you know, from my review of the literature. Is one is unrealistic expectations for a mentoring relationship. Boy, I've, I've had that. Um, and I've, you know, expected uh, something in my head of what this person should be like or what, what they should be able to help me do. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that, but yeah, I've put people up on pedestals before and of course disappointed because they're human. Um, they're not going to be able to be there all the time and they're maybe going through certain things that they can't fulfill those things. Um, not setting clear goals. Um, I think sometimes, I think when I was uh, early on in my career, I felt like I couldn't share my failures as much. And again, I've had some great leaders and mentors work with me since then. Um, I feel like I'm at a place where I, I can just like, some of you are so much uh, further advanced than I am. Uh, you're much more on that Maslow's hierarchy of needs than I am. But um, I think of just being able to say, hey, you know, this, this is not going well. Um, I'm not, I'm not doing well. Um, boy, it, you get more out of the relationship when you are able to do that. The other sometimes, you know, people just don't have time, and it may be that they had time at the beginning when the mentoring relationship started, but, you know, then their mom started not doing so well, and they had to be missing work a lot to, you know, get them taken care of, or they, you know, had a personal illness, or something happened at work, and all of a sudden they're acting chief of mental health. Um, you know, these things happen. Um, so, or then, you know, not following through. Um, when we're, we've said we're going to do something or, so, or someone. Um, so, the, you know, I want us to reflect on th really thinking through what can I do? What can I do as a mentor? What can I do as a mentee to make this as successful as possible? The other thing I wanted to highlight, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about so far is formal mentoring. There's a lot of informal mentoring that goes on all the time. and. Honestly, to me, I, I've had formal mentors both in Division 18 and AVAPL and um, other things through the VA. A lot of times I've gotten even more out of my informal mentoring program uh, processes than a formal program. So here it's just, you know, some of the different ways in which these differ. And I like John Crosby's quote, successful people turn everyone who can help them into a sometime mentor. Um, and I think that that's really true. Um, and you have to pick and choose what's best for you in your career right now. Like for me, I, I don't have a formal mentor right now. Um, you know, I travel a lot, do other things. Um, I, I do a lot of, uh, get a lot of informal mentoring from people and I seek that out. So when you're thinking about as a mentor, you know, when you're kind of thinking about how do I want to be available to people, you know, what's your time availability right now? You know, if you can't do a monthly meeting with someone, maybe the formal mentoring is not a good 
good uh, match for you right now. What do you want to accomplish? What are skills that you want to share with other people? How do you put yourself out there with, with that? And I think that's when we're doing presentations and things like that. Having people, you know, putting on there, please call me, please contact me, making yourself available and approachable for informal mentoring opportunities. Um, and then thinking through, you know, how important is it for me to select my own mentee? Um, if that's really important to you, you probably want to go the more informal route than the formal assignment route. Um, well, I think this is kind of a repeat here. The other thing that I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about is uh, peer mentors. Um, people, um, and there are some people on this call who probably don't know it, but they've been mentors to me. Um, there's a lot of benefits by choosing people that you are going to connect with regularly, um, that you admire, you respect how they do leadership, you respect how they work, and becoming friends with those individuals, and they end up mentoring you in many ways. Um, what I like about this is that, you know, it can be really flexible to your needs. Um, you can have a even you can make a formal peer mentoring group if you want, like a mentoring circle is what they sometimes call it. It can be short term or long term. It can also be informal. Um, I think the, the main challenge is it's got to be initiated by you or the other people. Um, you got to set some ground rules about that and you have some logistics around it. So I put up here a picture. Some of you know these guys. Uh, this is what I call my chips and salsa crew. Back when I went through the Behavioral Health Leadership Training Program in VA, which is wonderful. I enjoy, enjoy that tremendously. I met a couple of these guys in here, uh, John Klosek and, and Manny Garcia. And we were all kind of new uh, going into assistant chiefs of psychology roles at the time. And uh, we connected with George Shorter here, who you all may know. And we said, we want to create a chips and salsa group. And eventually Ron Geronda came on board. Um, and this group of guys got me through being a new chief of psychology. We met once a month. We had kind of a formal, what we called a chips and salsa club virtually on Friday afternoons at 4 p.m. Eastern. We'd call and, and ask each other how we were doing. We had goals for our growth as chiefs. You know, how the heck do you measure productivity of your staff? How do I deal with people cussing at me from the cuss report? Uh, we had ground rules. What we shared in there stayed in there. Um, so they mentored me a lot by seeing how they led their particular psychology programs. Um, and I imagine I mentored them at different ways, too. And so you can do mentoring this way, too. Um, what I want to share with you all, though, is I think it's so important that we reach behind us. All of you have accomplished great things wherever you are in your career. There's always someone behind you that you can be helping up to that next level. Um, I personally believe there's always time for mentoring. Um, if someone is reaching out to me, I want to be able to make myself available. Now, maybe, you know, 7 o'clock at night at some point I give time to them. Um, I may not be able to do formal mentoring, but I want to be able to reach back and help, help them out. Um, and realize for you, there may be times when formal mentoring is uh, not an option. There's just seasons in your life. You've got family priorities. You've got little ones at home. You, you cannot do that. But I would challenge you to think through how can you give back in those informal ways. Um, think about ways that you can proactively provide an open door to people. Um, even if that's virtual, um, you guys can see I'm in my house. I, you know, I work from home mostly these days, and um, people can reach out to me through link. They don't walk down the hallway anymore in the same way. Uh, they can reach out by email. I try to have a way in which the, I'm approachable in some way, um, and my mentors informally also are available that way. Um, I believe that mentoring is uh, next to uh, working with veterans and giving back the way that we do. The next best way that we help VA is how we mentor the people behind us and beside us. Um, it helps us to work through challenges at work, burnout that we may be facing. It helps with leadership development. All of these things are, are helping to promote great care for our veterans. 
And so it's it's a gift. It's a gift that we uh, need to be giving. Um, some last words, and then I want to have a, a, a moments for you all to share. But for those of you who are wanting to be mentored right now, and, and I think that that's all of us. As I said, I continue to have people who are mentoring me all the time, and I'm continuing growing. Um, oh, try to avoid that pedestal phenomenon. Um, all of us have limitations. Uh, we are going to disappoint you. Uh, your mentors will disappoint you at times. We're flawed people. Um, just because someone is flawed doesn't mean they can't help you grow. Um, and realize the expectations. That, you know, No one mentor can give you all that you need. Um, they'll be able to give you gifts of what they have and what they've learned across their career. Um, but they may not be able to give you everything that you're interested in. However, um, they can connect you to other resources. And so, like right now, I, I would say there's probably like three or four people who I would say are mentors to me, and they have different strengths and different ways. Um, you don't have to get that all from one person. Um, if you've been given the gift of being mentored, informal or formally, find a way to give that back. Um, uh, and I think that goes to that next time. You feel you're all, always a mentor to somebody else. John Maxwell, um, if you haven't read some of his books, has great leadership development um, books that I love to reference. But he has this quote, the best gift you can ever give your mentor is to grow. And this is so true. They feed off your growth. I believe that everybody has a seed of success inside, but too many people can't find it in themselves. And as a, as a result, they don't reach their full potential. But there are those whose purpose in life is to fertilize the seed of potential in another, who are rewarded by seeing that person grow and blossom before their eyes, raising up others to a higher level as a mentor's joy and sustenance. Um, sometimes your mentees grow beyond where you're able to grow too, which I, I actually think is really beautiful. I've seen um, some of my former residents and interns just accomplish amazing things, but giving back to those behind us. So I want to... Um, have the opportunity now for you all to um, interact a little bit. Um, like for you to kind of think through what do you need next um, in your mentoring life? What do you need from your mentors? Who do you need to find? Um, and how can you give back? Um, and that's one of the things I'd like for you all to think about. But let me open up the chat box. Monica, I think, I don't know if people have audio, but people can certainly type in questions or comments or reactions. So um, anyone who is attending does not have audio, but please feel free to use the chat box. I'm curious, as uh, some folks are typing too, to be thinking about, some of you may have joined this call kind of more of a, I want to be mentored, but um, are, are there things that maybe keep you from mentoring right now? Um, are there things that maybe um, get in the way or barriers? Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about that as well as how do you make time for mentoring, both mentoring others and receiving mentoring too? I see that Josh is typing something. Now, Monica, while people are typing up here, you know, I have a recollection of one of my mentors, Dr. Holiday, Steve Holiday. Um, when he did my 360, it bled. It bled. I mean, there was blood dripping off the page. <laughs> and I remember him telling me before he gave it to me, he goes, I am brutally honest on this thing. Um, you know, you often interact with me and you just hear all the encouragement and I think you're doing great things. But I want this to be a gift for you to grow in. Um, and that was a lesson learned too. I think I tend to, to be, uh, I try to focus on always being uber encouraging and, and things like that. Um, but the gift is often in the hard feedback as well. And because I felt psychologically safe with him, I could hear that. I could receive that more um, to help focus 
focus my energies on. I don't know if you've had anyone like that who gives you that hard feedback. I think that's really important, Lisa, that idea that with your in a mentoring relationship, when there's that trust, you can give and receive that hard feedback. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's a really important point because um, sometimes that relationship, um, because you're sometimes checking in about life outside of work, um, the work-life balance, things mm -hmm. like that, that it can feel safer to be able to get that feedback. I see a comment um, from Sarah. Um, oh, yes. Says here, would you be willing to share what some potential opportunities might be for BHA leadership mentorship positions? Um, perhaps both formal mm -hmm. positions and informal. Yeah, um, that's great, Sarah and Monica. You might want to speak up too for um, Division 18. Um, one of the things um, that I've appreciated. So there's a whole within VHA. There's a whole formal mentoring program. So you can both become a mentor and get certified. And there's uh, curriculum and coursework. And there's actually like practica hours that you have to do where you get mentored in mentoring, if you will. You can get like a resident or a fellow certification. I'd encourage that. It's a, it's a wonderful program. Um, and there's a hyperlink to that in here. Um, there's also the National um, Mental Health Leadership Mentoring Program. Boy, that's a mouthful. That's for new service chiefs or new chiefs of mental health. And that actually has like five different module areas people go through. They incorporate the 360 degree evaluation, et cetera. And that's, that's a wonderful program. I can connect you to that if that's applicable to you, both as a mentor and as a mentee. Um, the Association of VA Psychology Leaders uh, just had an uh, early career kind of mentoring program and they um, recruit folks once a year in that. I know I've benefit benefited from that both as a mentee and now as a, as a mentor as well. Those are great opportunities. I think for informal mentoring, um, one is, you know, going to one of the VA's leadership training programs. I told you I got my peer mentoring circle, my chips and salsa group, started with the behavioral health leadership training program. When you're in a leadership training program, there's lots of opportunity for you to get informal mentoring afterwards if you can connect with people through there. And the other is to go to the VA section meetings um, at APA, which are coming up. Um, and the AVAPL meetings as well, because you'll find other people who are in positions like yours or in positions you want to be in, where you might want to just say, hey, can I go grab and buy you a cup of coffee and I'd like to talk with you a little bit about this? Or you know, go to the VA Psychology Leadership Conference that AVAPL and Division 18 and um, APA kind of work together in May in San Antonio to do. Um, to me, that's where I get some of my um, connections for both formal and informal mentoring. Monica, I don't know if you have things to um, add on I want to echo that piece, and I think Josh um, just put something in the chat box similar to this, that when I think about, um, I've been involved in formal and informal mentoring relationships through Division 18 and the BA section. Um, we had a formal uh, mentoring program in, um, in Division 18 as well, um, and um, you know, I've actually, I think my career has actually taken its course because of some of the more informal uh, mentoring relationships I've had through people I've met through Division 18. Like when I think of some of the people I mentioned with energy and, um, and have done amazing things in public service, they've come from Division 18 and talking with them at the VA section meetings at APA, at the VA Psychology Leadership Conference. Um, so it's always a really, you know, one thing I strongly recommend is going to some of these conventions and conferences, or some of these more informal socials to be able to talk with people. You know, one of the best pieces of advice, kind of building on what you and Josh had just said that was um, helpful to me, is having someone say, Lisa, go to those social hours. I used to hate the social hours because I didn't, didn't know anybody. Go to the social hours. I want you know meet five or ten people. Make sure you get down their their name, so that when you get back home, maybe there's one or two or three that you had kind of an interest area in, or you feel like you could benefit from some of their knowledge in, and follow that up with an email. What happens is you end up building relationships of acquaintances over time who end up 
you know, becoming mentors and becoming friends over time, but you are very intentional about that. Or when you go to a conference and there's that listing of all the participants and what they do, you know, who do you want to seek out to meet? And, you know, I, I like to, I'm terrible about this, I glob on to people who I know know people to connect me. So, like, when I didn't know anybody, Steve Holiday, I'd be like, can you introduce me to anyone doing integrated primary care, please? And, of course, he knew a ton of people, and so he'd be like, yeah, you need to meet Pam Fisher from the Oklahoma City VA. And so trying to get connections that way to follow up on. Other ideas or thoughts that you all want to share, reactions about how to improve our mentoring um, uh, capability to give mentoring and to receive mentoring. I think. Well, let me give I, just a. a I do I'll wonder, go ahead, Lisa, Mike. if anyone is interested in some of the more formal mentoring programs that you mentioned through VA, um, uh, what's the best way to receive that information? Oh, absolutely. Feel, you know, one anything that I've mentioned today, feel free to email me and I can connect you with folks who run the different programs um, within VA or connecting you with um, other organizations that have that. I'm happy to do that. I am noticing that we're coming to the end of the hour. Um, so I was wondering if there's any last comments or questions that anyone would like to put into the chat box. Well, let me just give some closing thoughts while we wait on that, Monica. I think one is yeah, be intentional about who you are seeking out for mentoring from, you know, especially if you're doing informal. Um, be intentional about the people whose leadership you admire um, and seek them out. Um, with And join in, the, get, get through some of the formal mentoring programs. Those are invaluable. But don't be afraid to step out there and say, hey, can I grab you a cup of coffee or can I talk with you about X, Y, and Z? Um, I think that's particularly helpful. The other is uh, to never doubt that you're of help to someone behind you. Um, oftentimes I, I, I see people not volunteering to be a mentor. Oh, well, I've only done this job three years. I, you know, How much could I know? You know a lot more than someone who's just starting, <laughs> and that can be a value. So, you know, give back. And if I can be of assistance, there's lots of mentoring resources out there within BA. I mentioned some of them uh, to you on there, and I hyperlinked you to it. If you have difficulty finding it later, let me know. But I want to thank all of you uh, for the ways that you give back every day. And uh, I know I'm incredibly grateful for the Division 18 community that's mentored me across all my time in VA. So thank you, Monica, and thank you, Howie, and everybody else who helped organize this. And I just want to say thank you so much, um, Lisa, to you. Um, working with you and just putting together some of these projects is a lot of informal mentoring that I received from you. Um, and I want to, so thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, I'd like to also thank those of you who helped to get the word out to um, about this con this webinar to AVAPL and um, other sources. Um, and I just want to mention before, because I'm sure there's questions about this, um, that psychologists who are attending this will be receive can receive one um, continuing education credit for the event. Um, in the chat box, I've added the link to a SurveyMonkey um, evaluation that um, it, please complete this assessment by the close of business on Wednesday, July 25th. Um, and then it will be about a few weeks, usually um, about three to four weeks, and I'll be sending out these certificates um, around that time. If you have any questions about the CEs or anything we've talked about, I've already received some um, emails about the PowerPoints, and I'll be sending those out later in the day today. Um, please um, shoot me an email. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. Yes, thanks everybody. It was a pleasure being with you all and um, look forward to connecting by email or link or phone call later. Bye, Bye everybody.